So we all heard the stunning news on Friday morning around 1 a.m. that President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump tested positive for COVID-19. And this is just the latest in what has been a roller coaster year with an impeachment, a global pandemic, natural disasters, racial divisions, a presidential election, a raucous first debate, and now this. And many others have also contracted coronavirus, like Chris Christie and Senator Mike Lee. And we wish, we wish everyone a quick recovery. Since the news came out that the president and his wife have COVID-19, I've gotten questions about what this means for the election, if the president is in some way incapacitated. And again, we hope that none of this is necessary, but it is an opportunity to discuss what could happen in uh, a worst case scenario or any number of scenarios. Our guest today is Jane Hampton Cook. She's a historian, the author of Resilience on Parade, a book about the women's suffrage movement and uh, numerous other books in um, on American history. I have a number of her books right now uh, in my, my library here. Uh, our listeners will re- recognize her since we had her on, uh, her on the show not too long ago. So, Jane, thanks for being on our show. Thanks for having me. So, basically, uh, here we have the president potentially with an incapacitating uh, ailment. Hopefully that's not the case, but this brings up questions about what would happen. So what possibly could happen if he is incapacitated before the election? I think that's where the 25th Amendment would be invoked because they passed the 25th Amendment in the 60s after um, Kennedy's assassination and after Dwight Eisenhower's illnesses in the 1950s. And so what would happen, my understanding is that Mike Pence, the vice president, would become acting president if the president is incapacitated and that they would have to invoke um, doing some paperwork, sending it over to Capitol Hill, um, and, and Mike Pence would be an acting president as long as the president is alive, but he's incapacitated. So that that would be, I think, a, a scenario that could happen. Hmm. Now, what would happen with respect to the election? What would be the implications of that? I think that's a little less clear because, you know, certainly Vice President Pence's name is on the ballot. And, you know, there were some um, cases that were, you know, a vice presidential candidate died and you, the, the votes that were attributed to that ticket went to that ticket still. And so that I think. I don't know exactly, but I think that that's the most likely scenario is that there would probably be a dispute over whether the votes already cast would still go to, you know, the Trump ticket. But with the order of secession, you know, obviously, if something awful were to happen to the president, then Vice President Pence would be the next in line. It's just a matter of how that would go down. And I think what that would just invoke legal issues that would go into the courts is what I think would happen on that. What what I've I've heard is that it's possible that since early voting has happened, people have already voted for either the Democratic or Republican ticket, that the parties, uh, the party, if if their nominee is incapacitated, that party, their committee would have to choose potentially a new candidate. And mm-hmm. it's possible that if they choose a new candidate, then what would happen is that the whoever they whatever ticket they voted for would be considered a vote for that party since they're I guess the the technicality is that they're voting for the electors to vote for the party's nominee that's what I've heard I'm not I mean there's no that would make a lot of sense and I think if that were the case I think the committee would choose Mike Pence because to make it to to not make it any more confusing Mm -hmm. than you know to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible with the idea that people voted for that ticket, knowing that if something did happen to the top of the ticket, the next in line, if they were already, you know, that that I think that that would be the most sensible thing. Right. The and then the question would probably be if Mike Pence gets elevated, they would still have to choose a vice presidential candidate. And I'm not sure what the procedures are per party. Uh, there, there might be specifics about what committee, you know, who, who gets to choose and what are the mechanisms. But it, it, I've read that that's what it sounds like the party would have to choose. 
Right. And I think what concerns me is that the regular order of things is so, is a little, it's not on the top of people's minds, right? But we've had, right now we have a confirmation process going forward for um, Amy Coney Barrett. And you've seen people try to say, well, that's illegitimate because it's the last year of the presidency. Well, in fact, the constitution says the president it doesn't can is to nominate the Senate is to confirm. It doesn't talk about timing, but that has not stopped questions of trying to make it sound illegitimate, even though it very much is. Mm. So I think the PR aspect of what would happen would be pretty nightmarish, mm -hmm. even though if what, you know, what you said happened with the straightforwardness of the ballots, people voting for the ticket, the electoral college, we're nominating people to the co electoral college. All of that makes perfect legal sense. And, but I think we might have some just PR wise, I think there would be challenges. So oh, sure. Legitimize the process, whatever that process legitimately is. Right. Now you mentioned the 25th amendment. And I know there are a few mechanisms with the 25th Amendment, uh, and you mentioned different presidents who've had to invoke that. I, I recall when President Bush, George W. Bush, was in office, he had a colonoscopy, and he invoked it, which means that he basically handed off power to, to Vice President Cheney as the acting vice president, or I'm sorry, as the acting president, which right. that can happen. That's under the president's own volition. But I know there are also other mechanisms, right, in in the 25th Amendment, where the vice president and the cabinet can actually say that the president is incapacitated, regardless of what the president says. Do you know anything about those those mechanisms? Right. I mean, it's the it's section four of the 25th Amendment that the president and a majority of the principal officers in the executive department um, which would presumably be the cabinet, they would transmit to Congress um, and the, the president pro temp of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, the intention mm -hmm. of the vice president taking taking the reins um, I see. in that situation. Or it would be whoever they, yeah, that would be the, the transmission. So it, that's where you think of, you know, this law was written in the middle of the Cold War. So the fear at that time was nuclear war if that took out the president, then you would you would have that body within the executive branch of government, the cabinet, um, send that information to the Senate and to the House, notifying them mm -hmm. of the change. And, you know, that's obviously worst case scenario. Um, but, you know, it's interesting when you look back at when William Henry Harrison died, and his number two took over Vice President Tyler. They still didn't consider him the president. There was a lot of accusations that he was just the acting president, even though we see that as standard um, order of transmission with, with order of secession. Back then, when it they didn't they weren't they didn't think the Constitution was precise enough mm -hmm. about that. There was a question. There was a constitutional there question. There about it. And he right. really suffered as a president. Getting, he couldn't get any nominations through because they were acting as if he was illegitimate. And that's one reason why we have the 25th Amendment is to clarify what would happen in certain situations. And um, So you said... In the Twenty Fifth Amendment, uh, you said that it was the if the vice president and is it a majority of the cabinet? It doesn't say the cabinet, but it says okay. a majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments, which presumably is the cabinet. Oh, I see. Um, or of such other body as Congress may may by law provide, and then you transmit that to the president pro tem of the Senate and the Speaker of the House in writing that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of the office. And the vice president shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting president. Right. You know, and, and after 9-11, I know that they did a lot of rehearsals in the federal government on continuity of, of office, of operations, yeah. you know, of operations where different departments even were, were role playing what would happen in certain situations who would take over because, you know, we had Homeland Security by that point. And, you know, um, and we've seen with the pandemic, that it really does require the executive branch on some of these 
national responses to respond. Um, so it's not just the presidency, but it's also those executive officers implementing a response to to something. So, so just- it doesn't sound like uh, there's been any kind of uh, transfer from President Trump. He has not made Mike Pence the acting, even though there were concerns about his oxygen levels. And now we're getting the news that he could be discharged from Walter Reed, uh, which is a good sign as far as his health goes. Uh, so it doesn't sound like that could come into play here, but I guess, you know, hopefully it won't. There, you always have to prepare. Exactly. Right, exactly. And you know, it, it's not as if he's on a ventilator right now. Right. You know, we've, um, even the news about him getting oxygen, he was still, I think, in the 90th percentage of getting oxygen on his own. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think the best thing the White House has done has been to release videos of him. Mm-hmm. They released that video of him in the diplomatic reception room before he got on Marine One. It was short, but it was enough to let you see him. And then um, the video that they released on on Saturday showing him actually in Walter Reed um, upright. And I think that's the most reassuring thing. Um, and even, you know, the doctors, there's been some criticism of how the doctor has communicated with clarity on timeline of when this happened, et cetera. And I was thinking about that. I thought, well, you know, we have HIPAA laws, right? So a doctor is not trained to talk about a patient publicly. A doctor is trained to keep information about a patient private. And so, but yet it is so very different when the doctor is speaking about the president of the United States, who is his patient. And so it's, um, it, it's, that's one reason why this is unprecedented. You, you, the doctors aren't used to publicly talking about the symptoms of a president. So. Right, right. So what happens if a president is incapacitated after the election, but before inauguration, what are kind of the implications that could happen, say, if the president can't uh, take on the duties to be president? Well, I think in that situation, you're still going to have 25th Amendment transfer, you know, transferring to the vice president. And then it, it you know, it depends on, I think, the outcome of the election. Um, but you would have the vice president overseeing the transition to the either their new administration if they won the election or transferring it to the other party. But I don't think there's any scenario where um, because because the Constitution is very clear on when the inauguration and that transfer of power happens that I don't think you're going to have a situation where even if President Trump, you know, is incapacitated or worse where the, if President Biden, I mean, Vice President Biden won the election, he's not going to be in charge until January 20, you know, 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, I think it just, it creates a lot of just, uns- I think it leaves the p- people feeling very unsettled um, about, about, and if, if that were to happen, the vice president would need to be very reassuring mm-hmm. that the government is still moving forward. People are still doing their jobs. Um, the military is still following the directions of the Pentagon. Like to keep a sense of, of order and continuity would be really an important message to send. Right. And it's interesting. So, one thing that I think could be a question is that if you have a president elect, uh, let's say if Vice Pre- uh, President Biden wins or, or something, a scenario where that happens, um, and Lord, heaven forbid that, you know, anything would happen to him. But if a president, uh, or if, if somebody who wins the election uh, gets incapacitated in some way, what would happen is that that person, uh, the vice president-elect would take over. But I've read that there's some question over when someone becomes president elect because mm. uh, there's a presumptive president elect uh, mm. after election day assuming that that's what happens assuming that there isn't like a uh you know contested election and then the electoral college voters meet in their states 
to cast their ballots. And then by then, it's kind of becoming more official who's president-elect. But then there's the actual counting of the electoral votes in January before the mm-hmm. before the mm-hmm. Congress. And then there's a question of, is this person president-elect? And according to the Constitution, I'm not sure that that's spelled out. So that could be something disputed, which could be a big concern, especially considering that there's a possibility that this there could be a dispute in this election. Right, there is. That was already happening before this diagnosis of President Trump. Yeah, the the concerns over the ballots and the right. potential lawsuits over mail-in ballots and and you know, the, you know, I remember in the year 2000 how um how eerie it was being on the streets of Austin, Texas, watching these two big giant TV screens with one TV channel on one and one channel on the other and seeing the numbers flip where the votes for president for George W. Bush started going down and the votes for for Al Gore started going up. Mm -hmm. And then we had one state with chaos, Florida, for five weeks before it was settled. And I think the concern is that we might have several states that have um, concerning questionable outcomes. And right. um, well, I hope that's not the case. I hope that the, the election is definitive enough that, that, that there's not a, cons- that that doesn't create a scenario of chaos because 2020 has already been, <laughs> what it's been. Yes. and I think people need, um, they need security, I think, and right. not lost in their lives. So and with the way the country's divided, whoever is going to win, there's already going to be a great deal of uh, of anger on one side and joy on the other, <laughs> as it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I so the way I see it, the situation is is fraught because a if before the election uh, someone is incapacitated, then the party would have to choose who to replace them with. It would probably be the VP nominee, but still, it would probably be a bit of a spectacle. And then if it happens afterwards, then my concern is that on top of the usual, is this going to be a disputed election? Then will come the question of when is the the uh, the winner? When is this person the president-elect? And I hope that doesn't, because it's not spelled out in the Constitution. That could be an issue. That's, that's what I'm concerned about. Right, right. Yeah. Now, one thing that I always thought was a very interesting and relatively unknown situation was when Horace Greeley was uh, opposing President Grant. Grant was running for re-election in 1872. Greeley was the nominee of his opposi- the opposition party. It was actually the liberal Republicans that year. It was kind of an offshoot right. from the Republicans. And then he died. And from there, then on... So the actual candidate, he died after the election, but before inauguration. And the Electoral College voters, they just voted for a bunch of random people. Uh, but they still uh, – and it didn't really matter because he, he had lost, right? Now, if he what? had won, if he had defeated Grant somehow, and then he died after the, the election, that would have been a whole uh, – it, it would have been very difficult, especially back then – it, yeah. it would have been hard for the electoral college voters to come together and decide on a candidate because they're all in different states. It's not like now where they make right. communicate That's somehow. True. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that 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 is a very interesting point in history to to look at to think about. You know what what would have happened if it had been, you know, if he had won that election. Right. Because it wasn't. It was. Um, we're talking, we're talking 1872. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and that was just four years before the disputed 1876 election. You kind of see these, um, you know, these, these seismic, I don't want to, maybe seismic is too big of a word, but just you see fractures in society post civil war. And you see that, we had a few years there after the Civil War where politics were a little bit topsy turvy, and we had some really close calls with who won, and um, mm-hmm. and that 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 those fractures were going on for a few years um, because the country had been so divided, and it was hard for them to come back together. Right. They did come back together, but it was not easy because you had Democrats supporting 
Greeley a liberal Republican because they hated Grant so much. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't, it was a little bit similar that you have people, some, some people who are supporting Vice President Biden. It's not because of him, it's because they hate Trump. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, and you had some of those dynamics that did lead to that close election mm-hmm. um, in 1876, but also the Greeley situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, it, I think it's interesting that Greeley was, um, was you know a press person that that's true he was the editor know, of new york herald i think yeah he was right. that was his that's how well that's how he was known to people was through through that publication um right and, so uh, there have been numerous examples uh, examples of presidents that were incapacitated in some way uh wilson had what many people believe to be the Spanish flu or something like that. And he had the stroke, uh, Eisenhower, you mentioned president Reagan and the assassination attempt. What, uh, examples or what lessons do we have from those specific examples? Well, so I looked back at the newspaper headlines for when, uh, Wilson came down with the Spanish flu and he was in Paris in April of 1919. Um, his doctor knew he was ill but then headlines in the newspapers were Wilson narrowly escapes the flu. Wilson ill in bed has cold, not flu. And so the message was that he didn't have the flu. Um, but back then they didn't have a test for Spanish flu like they do for COVID. They didn't have a CDC. They didn't have any of these medical, these, you know, these medical advances that we take advantage, that we take for granted, just even testing. So it was just all based on the opinion of the doctor, what his diagnosis even was. So whether the doctor really thought he had the Spanish flu and he finessed it to the media or whether he just flat out didn't know and um, was, but it it left, um, in hindsight, it leaves kind of a big question mark as to what was really going on with Wilson. But the thing about Wilson he was not leading a national effort against the flu. He wasn't leading a, 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 like we've seen with President Trump. The the response to the Spanish flu was at local hospitals or mayors who were deciding whether or not they could have parades in their cities. Um, Wilson just didn't talk about the, the flu, even though it was a you know an epidemic at that time. And that that's I think a real difference is that I think our technology and our expectations of what the medical community gives us and tells us about sicknesses like this is just so very different than when Wilson was president. But when he did get sick later with stroke, they did conceal a lot of that from the American people. His wife did a lot more uh, for him than what was known at the time um, about that illness. And so, um, you know, they kind they were, and yeah, I was thinking back, I was like, what was the media like in 1919? And you had some moving images, but not, you know, Nickelodeon theaters, you didn't have sound yet. You didn't have it in film. You didn't have sound with film. You had newspapers and you had photography, but radio still was very much in its infancy. You didn't even have, um, radio in the robust way that you did in 1920, the 1920s with Calvin Coolidge's. Um, and, then, and then FDR. Broadcast. Yeah, and right. FDR. And so I think the context and the expectations of the American people were different because we didn't have this instant communication. And so that gave more breathing room, frankly, um, and it didn't require as much transparency from the president. I think the more technology has evolved, the more transparency we expect because we want to know it now, you know, and we, and we, you know, expect that. So that that's the difference. And then with Eisenhower, I was looking at the newspapers from when he went into the hospital and it, this, there's a similarity with Eisenhower in that it was an election year, but it was June of 1956. He, um, he was ill with an intestinal problem. They, they gave him, they treated him at the White House, and then it was clear he needed extra and more in, in intervention. So they, you know, in his PJs, he sent off on the ambulance to Walter Reed. And then the next day, the whole newspaper is filled with coverage. It's filled with Congress's response. It's filled with, you know, Vice President Nixon saying prayers. Then there's this whole timeline 
that somebody gave to the media, um, a, probably Mrs. Eisenhower or an aide of the play-by-play -play of the, this timeline of what made them decide to go to the hospital. But he was there for three weeks. Um, he got an infection after his surgery. And so he was there for three weeks. And toward the end, he did start to do some real work. They would, get, they would give him bills to sign. And then instead of giving him 30 bills to sign at once, he would sign 10 at a time and take a break. And, um, but there was whispers that the American people might factor his health into their, um, to the election in November of that year, but they didn't. He won with more than 400 electoral college votes um, and won the popular vote by 15%, you know, a, a plus 15%. So it didn't affect the election, but it did raise those questions that led Congress to pass the 25th Amendment because people remembered the several times when Eisenhower was ill with a heart attack and then with this intestine problem. And, and, um, and he was already, I mean, it passed his sixties and when he left office, he was the oldest president to be in office yeah. at the time. So there was a real concern about that during the cold war. Uh, Absolutely. I had yeah. read that his doctor actually had misdiagnosed him. I, I don't know if that, that was a specific example. It might have been there then or another time. But. I think, yeah, I think that because, you know, it was an intestinal problem. I don't know if it was on that particular condition, but yeah, I think that's probably possible that they mm -hmm. didn't didn't quite know what it was and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the the um, they they talked about it in the newspapers. They had a photograph of Mamie, the Eisenhower's wife and their son going into Walter Reed. And I think the reason that we have a big presidential suite at Walter Reed is because of Eisenhower having to spend some time there. Um, I realize they've built a new building and all of that kind of thing, but, but still just the realization that we need to, we need to anticipate what would happen if a president was in the hospital and needed time. And, um, you know, we saw Reagan spend, um, I think he was at George Washington University. I read 11 days and then went home. Um, but the reason that there is a children's mail, children's correspondence division within the White House correspondence office is because of Ronald Reagan getting shot. Hmm. They received so many, he received so many letters from children that they had to devote a staff member and volunteers to going through all that mail and responding to it. And they just created a new department and um, that continued. Uh, and he, he um, talked about the little boy that wrote him a letter and said, I hope you get better soon so you don't have to give your speech to Congress in your pajamas, you know? <laughs> right, right. Um, that was his perception. Um, and you know, Reagan, he was an older man, the oldest president, I think at the time, um, when he took office and he got shot within, you know, weeks. A couple of months, president. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what I what I think is so special, though, about Reagan getting shot is that the way Congress responded, they gave him a standing ovation when he after his recovery and he walked into the House chamber. And there was just a definitive bipartisan uh, embrace of just the humanity of that situation. And the, the political tension wasn't so high that people couldn't get past themselves and um, and look to the humanity of, of his situation. And I, I think you've seen a little bit of bipartisanship in some of the statements from President Obama and others, but Vice and certainly Biden. Biden, Biden has done well, but not everybody has, sure. um, you know, today with what's going on right now. And so, right. but th those are some of the, but again, just that concern. And now remember, with vice when reagan was not that i remember i remember when reagan was shot i don't remember this about it until studying it later but just the confusion over where vice president bush was and al Haig taking charge or making a statement saying that he was more in charge than he really was the, the sec you're referring to the secretary of state the secretary right. of state yes feeling that confusion sort of that fog of war that fog of confusion that happens in an emergency um, mm -hmm. has affected a lot of presidents until things kind of settle down and they're clear. So um, a, a, another famous uh, situation where a president, his health was basically a, a, a you know, a kept secret was uh, 
was Franklin Roosevelt, not just with his uh, polio, but specifically in the last year of his life where he basically gets a diagnosis that uh, his heart is, he's on his way to heart failure. Uh, right. But then right. the his doctors basically tell the American people that he's fine. And then uh, one of the cardiologists, I believe it was Leahy, Frank Leahy, wrote a letter to FDR's doctor saying this man might not survive a fourth term. And mm-hmm. one so one thing that kind of hits me looking at all these examples, whether it's Wilson uh, or FDR or even Eisenhower, is that when a president is sick, historically, it is not unprecedented for the White House to kind of uh care about the effect that could have on the country uh or on their agenda and to basically fudge the truth a little bit that has happened in american history without a doubt at the same time when we look at say kennedy's assassination the reagan assassination attempt any t- or eisenhower it sounds like at the same time the mechanisms we've had to have this sense of stability that somebody's in charge you know if, uh whether that is uh, Dick Cheney being acting president. It seems like we haven't had situations get too crazy, although there may have been a lot of confusion in those situations. I think that's a really good assessment that things have not gotten too crazy. I mean, we haven't had a coup. Mm-hmm. We haven't had, um, you know, we, we have had overall stability through those situations. And I was reading an article about FDR that they actually think that the doctors kept a lot of information from FDR that he didn't even know how bad a shape he was really in. Um, And that may have been very much, that sounds like that was very, if that's true, that sounds like that was very purposeful on the doctor's part. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, in 1944, we've been, you're dealing with World War II and um, it's a pretty tenuous time for, um, it was, you know, it was difficult for, and I think they did, I think they knew enough about his health that that's why they chose Harry Truman to be his running mate that year. They had to take into consideration the the possibility that this, the next VP would most likely become president. So choosing a Senator from the Midwest who was young, healthy, um, enough like-minded to take over um, but, you know, even when he did take over, he was unaware of the nuclear bomb plans. He had, he had not been read into that to that plan. And so he he inherited quite a load from FDR. But, it, but it, that goes back to your point that things haven't gotten too crazy. Things may not have always been 100 percent transparent and above board, but they didn't get um, to a place of anarchy yeah. um, where the whole system of government and branches of government broke down because of because of it. May, maybe in spite of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So uh, one last question I wanted to ask, uh, and this is a related question. Um, people are talking about the possibility of a tie in the Electoral College, which would be uh, uh, it, it would be quite a scenario if that happened, uh, or some sort of disputed result. So what would happen in that case, and how do you think this could be affected by? a president being incapacitated in some way? Well, if that happens, I'm not, I've read a few articles and there is a pretty involved process that I'm not sure I can completely <laughs> say, explain, but that's one reason why it's important to look at the, um, we don't do this very often, but when you look at the overall delegation of states and their representation in the House and the Senate. Um, The Republicans, I think, have more combinations of Congress, people in Congress, people in the House and in the Senate than the Democrats. And so I think if it goes to the House of Representatives, that's part of the calculus is, is, is a combination of which party has control overall, um, who has dominant representation. So, yeah, I mean, that would be a pretty, that would be another nightmare scenario, especially if you have an, a president who's still very ill. Um, right. You know, that, that would create even more confusion. And um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think from what I've read, your thoughts on that? Yeah, it it would go to the house. The presidential race would go to the house, and it would be the top three vote getters. It, that's irrelevant because it would be Trump and Biden. The Senate mm-hmm. would then choose between Harris and um and uh, Pence, and then in that case, it it depends on the delegation. Uh, yeah. it, it depends which party has the most seats per state, right? Right, the that's what I was trying to say, yeah. Right, and yeah. then uh, from what I've read, so the, the Republicans, I believe, in the House have 26, a majority of in 26 states. The Democrats have a majority in 20, 23 states, and then Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. I think, is tied. So then that would become a question. And mm-hmm. But then what happens then is that if it, first of all, this would be, uh, the, the Congress that would choose it would be the next elected Congress. So that's all up in the air. Uh, I see. Secondly, and- uh-huh, if if it does get to that point, uh, I think there are a few questions about um, how, as far as like the, the delegations, uh, if it's a tie, does that state count as, or is it only the states that vote? I mean, there there are a few questions that I think would have to be settled, which could get really hairy. It could get really complicated, right. and uh, I mean, I think it would be the last thing that we could need as a country. And there, there would, I, from what I've read, Speaker Pelosi and I, I'm sure the Republicans too, they're all kind of planning out these scenarios and making sure everyone is in line. They're probably talking to the people that are running right now that could win and are saying you need to vote. You need to stay party line on this. So who knows what could happen? Right, right. Yeah, but I think I did hear someone say that they had come up with two different ways the Electoral College vote could end up being tied. Right. It's just based on the way the way different states are leaning right now mm-hmm. um, toward the candidates. Um, well, yeah. So it's just it's just a very interesting time right. and i don't know i haven't decided in my i haven't figured out in my head how president trump's diagnosis will will affect the the election um if he gets sent home tomorrow um and recovers fully in the next week um will this feel like a blip by the time we get to november 3rd or will this really have some lasting effect will it Will there be more support for him because there's sympathy for him? Will there be more? Um, I don't know. It certainly, he couldn't have written a screenplay about a, a presidential election with more twists and turns than this one has. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. It, one of my favorite movie lines uh, is uh, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. And I, I think that for some reason that's in my mind right now, as I think about all this and yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, uh, I mean, you hate talking about political implications when it involves people's health. But one thing I will say is that after the assassination attempt on President Reagan, uh, you saw people pretty impressed, not just because a a, a near 70-year-old man was able to – or actually a 70-year-old man was able to – to survive that, but also the fact that he took it with a lot of good humor. I mean, there are all those stories of him telling Nancy, oh, darn, I forgot to duck. And then he looks at his doctors and he says, I hope you're all Republicans. And then all of them look at him and say, we are today. I mean, just stories like that. Right. So we'll see. But anyways. Yeah. Just how incredible it must have been for those doctors at that hospital to all of a sudden you have president of the United States in your emergency room. Yeah, it, it must have been uh, unreal, and yeah. uh, I believe that happened at GW Hospital. So I guess they might assume that. I mean, hopefully that would never have to happen, but it might have crossed their minds. But to have it actually happen and to see the president of the United States, I mean, uh, there there are stories of when uh, or when you hear about the doctors that operated on President Kennedy, uh, yeah. and which must have just been surreal, especially considering Kennedy's condition was basically hopeless at that point. Um, But anyways, uh, obviously we hope that everyone who has coronavirus uh, is, is recovers and is healthy and and regardless of party and and everything. So uh, obviously prayers directed towards them, but anyways, and, and really hopefully for the country that this doesn't, uh, 
unravel anything more than <laughs> things are already uh, unraveled or, or strained as it is. So that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. right. But Jane, uh, thank you again. We love having you on the show. We appreciate all of your insights. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. That sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. This American President is produced by myself, Richard Lim, and Michael Neal. If you like what you've been hearing, you can help us by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our show. We are a proud partner of Evergreen Podcasts. Please visit evergreenpodcasts.com for more shows you might enjoy. I'm Richard Lim. We're back next time with more This American President.